it took uh, a couple of weeks more to, to make it here. <laughs> and uh, finally, he worked on and designed the Newspeak language, which uh, takes probably experience from small talk and maybe self, and is going to be released real soon now. Isn't it? It's been released. No one cares, but it's been released. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But none of these is why I invited uh, Gilad. Uh, <laughs> I invited Gilad because he also worked on the stroke, strong talk language, which was about uh, which was released in the 90s uh, and uh, was one of the, if not the one of or the first language with optional typing. Or, what is what we call optional typing now. And um, so the influence of strong talk uh, endures. We have a paper uh, this, uh, in this conference called Strong Script, which takes the best idea of strong talk and bastardizes them, bastardizes them with JavaScript, <laughs> as it should be. <laughs> <laughs> So I think I've done enough damage. Did you second it? Yeah, yeah, please, please, it's up to you. We just have a vote now, please continue. <laughs> Alright, so I will continue then. <laughs> so, the next, the next bit is, I, I have prepared a couple of questions, but we are certainly going to entertain questions from the audience, so I'll just kick it off and then see uh, how it goes. So, the, so my idea is I'll start asking Gilad, then ask the same question to Matthias, and maybe have a communication or, you know, we'll maybe just not. ignore each other. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I'll, I'll start with a softball. Uh, so, originally, what drew you to dynamic languages? Uh, the programming environment. Python, <laughs> right? I'm talking about something. That, that has real quality to it, and yes, it's the, it's the experience, it's the programming environment, the tool, the, the debuggers, all that nice stuff, that's what really draws you to that. Uh, sorry, what's the answer you expect? <laughs> Double lock. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody told me to write prologue, lots of prologue, around 1981-82, and uh, it was my first untyped language. I was still in business school at the time, I didn't know better. And I went on in January 84, I started a PhD, and I discovered closures and continuations, and I fell in love, and I didn't know it was untyped. And I just continued, and then I kind of typed about four years later, and they're like, what's that stuff? Why would you want to use types? Uh, so it's just an accident. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, so then I'll ask you, do you hate static types? No. No? No. <laughs> I don't hate them. They, they annoy me, but uh, I don't hate them. And again, it's a matter of, of how they're used and to what purpose. Yes. So, so let me supplement my note too. I, I, in the 90s, I was known to say that types are stupid. And I would say there's a couple, which didn't make me very popular then. <laughs> it doesn't make me very popular now. Uh, what I meant at the time was that research on types and type soundness smothers research on programming languages. But if I had a work in industry, I would definitely use a programming language with a rich type system, and ideally a sound one. That's two different notions. Programming language people should explore the dynamics of the programming language, the expressive power and once we have settled on expressive power in about 2,315, we should start doing type research on that. <laughs> but right now, it just smothers our development, and we have had a stagnation in programming language research because we have overemphasized types and verification. As I said, unfortunately, this is not popular, otherwise we'll be dead by now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll play it for them. I won't be dead. Uh, so, yeah, you want me to elaborate on that? First of all, I, I very much agree with most of what Matthias said, except the thing about industry and using the types, uh, which is, it depends what you're doing and where and what kind of system you're using. 
Uh, and I, I, I'm not convinced that you know, given the type of systems we have and the tools we have that we wouldn't be better off using something different uh, and, and types would be a small part of that. Types smother a lot of things. The emphasis on types, if you look at modern IDEs, the emphasis on the static side of things, the enormous effort that's put into to all these static kind of crutches and aids, which are kind of nice tool tips and, and uh, you know, name completion and all that in environments that don't have a decent debugger and don't actually let you develop a program or see what the state of anything is, is, is just a massive uh, misallocation of resources and, and effort. So it's, it does real enormous damage to the industry as well. I think you're, you, you're ignoring the quality of programs that we have in industry. Given the quality of programs you have in industry, I think you want types. Uh, so I actually, there, there's several things. I mean, I'm as, as good at insulting people as anyone, but I don't like to speak about the quality of programs in industry. Like, of course, they're not like, uh, you know, PhDs in academia. Um, yeah, that works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, programmers are certainly much worse, but the programmers in industry, like anything else, vary all over the map, and it isn't an issue of their quality, it's the issue of, of the culture and tools and, and demands made on them. And whether types are the solution to that, or, or a, a, even an important component of the solution to quality problems in software, is something where, you know, I, I less and less buy the conventional wisdom. So, uh, you know, types evolve. The, 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 the argument for types is, you know, the cost of a mistake, trying to get things correct. That's the main argument people make, which is the wrong argument because correctness isn't where they actually necessarily contribute that much. But if you want to, to, to check things exhaustively, it's because the cost of an error is very high. But there are other paths to developing software where you can reduce the path, the cost of an error. If you have a stack of, of, of uh, paper cards like you used to and you went to the data center and waited three days to hear that there's a semicolon missing, it made sense to have something statically tell you about that. No. Did, didn't it make sense? You'd rather no. not? You just report a static error. Come on. What? Most of these kids don't know what a deck of cards is. That's <laughs> right. That, I'm very well aware of that. But the point is, if it, <laughs> takes, three days, days, <laughs> if it takes three days to get an answer, the cost of an, a small error is high, and you would like to, you'd like to evolve tools that kind of help you with that. If you live in a wonderful environment where you know everything is easily evaluated instantaneously, the kind of errors that most type systems find for you are found very quickly. Yes, they're found at runtime, but runtime isn't some distant thing when your 747 is crashing into the sea. Runtime is on your desktop in the first two minutes when you put in your program, and it doesn't really take any more time than it is to figure out what the Haskell compiler said. <laughs> and so these are different evolutionary paths to, to try to solve a problem, to, to help with errors. And if you have the right tooling, the need for types in the right kind of language. Again, I don't want to generalize. Haskell probably needs types, whatever you do. <laughs> no, I'm serious. There's, there's a reason for that. But, in an object, in the kind of languages that I'm interested in, that most of industry is working with, with object, with objects, with give you kind of a type structure informally anyway. In those kinds of languages, with the right kind of environment, as you had with list machines or in small talk and self and so forth, you can write all the software you want without types and the idea that types will give, solve your quality problems or actually make a significant difference in that is something that I find utterly bogus. It's a myth that people, you know, subscribe to and repeat and keep saying, in the, you know, and, and that makes it true in some sense. But it's a myth. May I ask the audience a question? The question is, how many of you have heard of leprechauns? How many of you have heard of software? How many of you have heard of software engineering leprechauns? Only two people, three? Do you know what I'm talking about? There's a little book on the web. And I, 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 I'm sorry, I apologize if the author's in the room, I don't know who wrote it, I, I forgot. It's a little book that, went, that goes through some of these myths in, from the software engineering side. In particular, this person chased down where the myth comes from that the bugs discovered early cost so much less than bugs discovered late. It turns out there is no work. There is no work that confirms the order of magnitude cost. If you want to actually confirm that, I would welcome you to go out there and confirm this 
myth of leprechaun as this person calls it. So, so there is something to that. Otherwise, of course, I agree with Gilad that in my mind, types discover uh, good, I mean, practical type systems discover typo level errors uh, that you want to avoid. Uh, I think that a lot of us are sloppy in our work. I include myself here. And you do those, you make those typo level mistakes. When you make a conscientious effort, you don't. For one year, I used simultaneously SML of New Jersey and uh, Shade Scheme to produce reasonably large little prototypes. And I recorded a lot of my errors. And uh, I will completely agree with Gilad that if you focus on, on what you're doing, you do not make those mistakes. And the, the, the dynamic debugger pinpoints those few mistakes very quickly. Which I didn't have, of course, as SML because type programs can't go wrong. Oh, oh. So yeah, I agree with you on that one. Uh, but as I said, we are sloppy when we have average words. We, we slug off and type systems capture a few of those typo errors that are annoying to find two minutes later in runtime, if you have the right tests. So can I ask now a slight redirect? So going back to, to the previous work on stroke talk, uh, can you describe your goals with the design of Strong Talk? Well, Strong Talk had most of the goals of Strong Talk had nothing to do with <coughs> types. Uh, right? Small Strong Talk was designed to be a fast VM for for Small Talk, and uh, while we were at it, we we had mix-ins in the VM. We had we had various uh, you know we over innovated along many dimensions. We had a, a, lot, a lot of fun with it, uh, but the type system specifically, uh, we thought it would be helpful. Uh, probably at the time, I believe more of the of the utility of types than I believe today. Uh, we thought it would it would help with errors, and you know we, it's not a huge body of experience we had with it. What we found was yes, there occasionally was something that was in the library that the type system had found that we hadn't found before that didn't seem to be a path that arose in practice. But yes, there are those, but those were literally one or two in, or, of these in the whole library. What we did find is sometimes it's very handy to be able to find these statically and not have to, to run the program. It's a useful thing to have. It didn't make a big difference. But our goals were, <coughs> primarily at the time, were correctness. And, but, but as we did this, we, we realized that the real value we saw was, was documentation. Yes. That especially in, li in, li in these languages like Smalltalk, right? There's a, big, there's a nice large library and it really helps to know what the types write. Javadoc is a wonderful thing, not because it's a very clever idea to do this through some hack in HTML, but because at least the Javadoc the, for the core libraries that Sun produced actually was fairly good quality description of what these things do. And largely that's an investment because, you know, there's actually comments that are meaningful and there are subtleties that are described there, but just having the types there is helpful in that regard just knowing what's there. So if I had to list what types are important for, I wouldn't put correctness anywhere near the top, right? The, there's documentation for humans, documentations for machines, which means that they can do better tooling, and there's a conceptual framework that helps you think about the problem, and that's also valuable, right? And, and then there's, of course, it does help people get things faster in some cases. And last and least is correctness. What fraction of your documentation was expressible in types? Uh, you know, you want 7.6% or I, I, I don't quite know. Yeah, you want that, but um, I have no <laughs> way to give you that. I don't know. Uh, I think that there are obviously there are many things that you can't express through the types. Mm -hmm. And if you, if an organization like Sun with that, with that money and focus had decided to build a small dog and document the small dog library with something like Java doc and, and insist that every last method had had careful documentation, the types might be less important, but the types are really nice at a glance to, to see what's happening. But of course, there's all kinds of subtleties that the type system doesn't capture. <coughs> the, the proportion, the fraction, yeah, three. <laughs> so uh, I'll ask the same to you. What was, uh, what were your goal with the design of Type Bracket? Um, type Bracket was the end point to my search for a soft type scheme. We had pursued soft, sky, soft typing starting in the late 80s, 87, uh, late 87, early 88. And at the time, uh, it was not, it was about uh, prototyping is quick in typeless languages, type, you know, untyped languages. Uh, and uh, you can then later on harden these 
untyped prototypes into real programs. That was the idea. Uh, we had no evidence other than our own programming experience that untyped programming would create prototypes faster. We were very convinced of that. Uh, types we saw as number one, uh, documentation. Number two, when we understood at the time already that type soundness is not an absolute statement. It's a very common misunderstood problem. The first time I met Milna, I said, you lied. Type programs go wrong. Up to. The, the correct soundness statement is type programs don't go wrong up to an explicitly enumerated list of bugs, of errors that you can see. But when you do see those errors, and you do have a good border between the runtime system and your type code, then you get a very precise location, even if it's not on the stack, and even if the debugger <coughs> can't see it. So that was number two. Uh, number three, I imagined that eventually computers would be fast enough. I mean, we're talking about computers that had about 100 meg, and they were the biggest on campus, right? Uh, that they would be fast enough to do this online, and that would be helpful. That it would take 25 years to get to the point where they are in that speed. That's you know, it's a different story. But that was uh, those three things you know to get uh, documentation correctness up to and debugging information from the type error when it, when it, from the runtime exception when it gets signaled. Those things are very important to us. Uh, so type record then was the end point of the search of saying programmers don't want to write down types. We just infer them for them. Inference, we started with Hindley Miller. We went off from the ordinary type algebra that is generated over the arrows and sums and products that you usually see in talks like this one, this conference. We did a very unusual type algebra. It didn't work. We did a different unusual type algebra. It didn't work. And the failure is not in the type algebra. The failure is in the unification that you use. You can't find, if your type checker reports mistakes in your understanding of the type discipline of the program, you can't find how to fix it. It's much easier to fire off the untyped program, let it run into a bug, and then use the debug information to go back. So we went to a different inference system, the, what Cormac uh, did for his dissertation, uh, set-based analysis. Now with set-based analysis, as I <coughs> made this joke this morning in one of his students, this afternoon in one of his students' talks, you can actually use the transitive closure computation to explain to the programmer with a program slice where the error originates. That's great. Even seniors in college can understand that. <laughs> but when you scale it up to 2,000 lines of code, then it starts breaking. And at 3,000, the computer runs to ground and hole. We modularized that in the fourth dissertation. It still didn't do much better, even though we now had a gig or two in our computers. We just needed way too much space to generate these transitive graphs. And at that point, I got to the late 90s, I started the idea that we should have explicit types because documentation. The, the type, there were two problems. Number one, we couldn't infer them fast enough. And when we, when we, when we inferred them error-free, the types were so big and so precise, no programmer wanted to know them. <laughs> We're not talking about a little type that's like two lines long for a, a, a three-line program. It was you know, 10 lines of type information because it gave you all the knowledge it had. Even if you compact it, it's, small, it's still not small enough to be comprehensible once the program gets reasonably big. <laughs> so I decided explicit static typing with type checking was the way to go, but I did not want to convert, at the time, 500,000 lines of record code all at once into type code. So I asked Sam whether he couldn't come up with an incremental way of doing it. I'm really bad at making slogans, so we had this incredibly long, like, ten mounds glued together. You see my origins? Right? That's a German name. So, so <laughs> then, and then Jeremy came come with along six weeks earlier and said, it's gradual typing. So that's how the term stuck, but type record was the same idea. Gradual typing, move modules. What was the actual trigger? I'll tell you the anecdote. The actual trigger was Matthew Flat visiting me in 2002. And I asked him to fix a bug that Philippe Meunier and I had found in his implementation of Algo 60 that lives inside of Dr. Record. Algo 60 was implemented on Christmas Day 2001 in an afternoon. And it was a gift to me because it was my first language. 
<laughs> and so I got this thing when I found a bug. And we opened the file, and it was horrifying. It was one function, 18 <coughs> lines long. And there was one line of comment in there, about three lines into the file. It starts here. <laughs> <laughs> so then I asked Matthew, can you fix that bug? And he said, oh, no problem. We went to the rebel and applied this function <laughs> to some arguments. And it became very obvious after about 15 minutes of poking around, he could, it was six months later, right? He couldn't remember the order of the arguments that were passed to the main entry point of the runtime. There were eight arguments. We clearly, clearly missed one somewhere, right? There were eight of them, right? So here's the master program, somebody I would trust my life with, and he can't remember in what order he passed in the environment, the store, the uh, continuation, the, the I.O. system, whatever, you know, the whole thing. And I, that's pretty bad. He has to read 800 lines of code to find exactly where he moves what. I said, we need to do better than that. So that was the anecdotal trigger that actually did it. And in that sense, it really good. It, you really need it for that. Don't write lines, 800 lines per functions. <laughs> that's, of course, the other lesson. OK. So um, can you, you give us a, what, what is your definition of optional typing? Uh, sure, optional typing is two things. You don't have to write the types, but that's the, that's the first thing people think of, but that's not the important one. The important one is it doesn't, the, whatever is the types are, they're written down, they don't impact the runtime semantics in any way. And that's actually, and, and the, we, got a, we, we discovered this by accident, of course. I mean, I'd like to claim that we were that clever, but basically the thing is the first prototype of strong talk was done on top of Parkway small talk, and we didn't have the option of fiddling with the runtime. And that's also what happens with TypeScript, for example, right? The way to keep you honest is you work on someone else's dynamic language and you can't change the language. So A, you can't claim that you can, this program should not run because we know it already runs, it runs without any types whatsoever. And B, you can't change how it behaves based on these type decorations. So you can't do things like overloading in Java that statically changes which function it's going to call based on what, what uh, names you, you, know, you attach to the arguments, for example. You, there, there's various features like that. And that means that, for example, your type system doesn't interact with your runtime. That means you can have multiple type systems for different purposes and plug them in, at least in principle. Uh, and it means that you never, your runtime never carries the weight of some garbage that someone came up with just because it's types, right? If it isn't necessary to run the thing, it isn't there, and you never have to worry about reified generics and all the, the dead weight that things like that, you know, cause. So, yeah, I think that's, the definition is just two things, and the important one is no effect on the runtime. I want to ask you sort of a, a similar, or a closely related question, just, we've, earlier today we were using terms micro and macro to talk about whether when you do your migration between static and dynamic, whether it can be like on a parameter by parameter basis or at module by module basis. And it's hard to tell from the literature that I've read what, uh, where sort of strong talk fell in, in this uh, spectrum. Okay, so, so a couple of things. Strong talk didn't uh, confront this problem. I mean, we thought about it actually. We thought about there was a state where we thought, what if we actually had fully typed code and we could check at the bottom? And, and we said, oh, that's complicated. We don't know how to do that. Let's, let's forget about it. <laughs> and uh, so, so, you know, we also thought about things like name completion, and we didn't do that because with a 90 megahertz Pentium, we thought it would be too slow to respond to every keystroke, which probably would be. So, so there's things we didn't do just because of the time and the situation. And in particular, this boundary, therefore, didn't matter. We, we essentially, if you want to say, erased all the types. And so you could choose to. <coughs> I mean, I don't think we did that very often or, or recommended it, but you could, you know, take a given parameter and just give it a type, and that would, it wouldn't have any effect either way in terms of what got called, right? It, it didn't, it never, we never enforced anything at the runtime. Uh, now, but what about if you, statically, like, was there a, a story oh, from a static type check <coughs> perspective about the interaction? Right, so statically, oh, the, way, the way it actually worked is you, you had the option of <coughs> running the type checker in various places in the environment. You could run it on an individual <coughs> method, you could run it on a, on a class, you could run it on everything, and you could choose to, to go run it. And it was lacking, the crucial thing that was lacking from our, that was that it, <coughs> it didn't incrementally figure out, if you change some signature, what are all the dependencies 
it didn't do that. You'd have to go back and, and retype check something. So that was that was a, the biggest miss, missing piece, really. But nothing that uh, you could choose to to put types randomly wherever you wanted to, partially or whatever, and it would you know <coughs> if you ran the type checker, which you didn't have to run at all, but if you did, it would give you these these errors very very locally. The recommended style was we found it very useful to document the parameters. And even if we did <coughs> not type check the body of a method, even if we were making up the parameter types and maybe they were wrong, it was still quite useful in, in catching things that people that you were passing in that were irrelevant and in documenting even roughly the intent of it. It doesn't have to be 100% true. So I don't know if I answered. That's, that's fantastic. Thank you. So what would you um, say as a the definition of gradual typing for you? Look, so gradual typing, as I described before, uh, in my mind is the attempt to add types, static types, explicit static types, to a code base that does not have explicit static types with the guarantees that they are statically checked, <coughs> and then in those portions of code that are statically annotated, you won't get certain classes of errors. Or in other words, you get, you get to run this program and only this explicit list of exceptions is raised from that portion of the code. Uh, it, at the same time, when you interpret code that is typed in that sense, interact with untyped code written by the same people, then uh, this untyped code should not violate in any way the assumptions that the type code made there. Uh, I would add a third one. Uh, what I didn't say before is if you write code from scratch, I believe that types are very important to design your code properly, whether you have types in the language or not. Okay. So I would actually like to see that Gradual typing, as you go forward, enables you to design code based on the type language that you provide in a very good and elegant manner. Uh, I believe the idioms that involve untyped code are very good, and I think we should continue to support them, and in that spirit, the type system should just support the design. Code design. So I, I wanted to raise a point here, because gradual typing, I find it's being used in two ways, which I find rather confusing. And I can trace both of them to your original paper, I think. Okay. Um, so <laughs> my God, it's his paper, not ours. Because I think the, the term originates with you. Yeah, the term and, originates, yeah. And there's a defini there actually is a definition there, as I recall, of gradual typing, which basically sort of covers pretty broad territory, any, anything that's dynamically typed that has types being added to it and, and so forth. On the other hand, the work specifically was about this problem of the boundaries. Mm -hmm. And having the same term refer to both of these is very confusing. Mm -hmm. So this idea, and, and gradual typing actually, is that all? Yeah, just a second. Right, gradual typing actually does involve, as far as I can tell in most realistic implementations, some sort of dynamic check at that boundary, mm -hmm. which violates my, my claim on optional typing. Mm -hmm. And to me, there's, there's two ways to look at this. We can look at it, there are two languages. One is really typed, and it can do whatever it wants. And it checks that its inputs meet its requirements, right? And that's okay. But then the, the dynamic side never has to do anything. Right? And that there's a, there's a clear boundary there. If you look at it as it's the same optionally typed language and in some places you're putting fully typing things, then, you know, and it's one system, then the question is, do I need to bear, carry this burden and, and it's costly and so forth. Uh, but Sam probably had a comment on all this. I think that those are actually the same thing and that it's yes. a mistake to think of them as different because if we have both the defining characteristic of having both typed parts of your program and not typed parts of your program is that there exists some boundary between them. If there wasn't some boundary between the typed part of your program and the not typed part of your program, then either you'd not be using one of them or they wouldn't be interacting or some other uninteresting degenerate variation. It's because there's a boundary that there exist these questions like that, uh, that we get to disagree about. And well, therefore, so, it's the boundary that 
is really the interesting part. Yes. Okay, so the assumption that, of course, there's a boundary at any point between, you know, when you pass a parameter and there's a type on it or, or whatever, but the assumption, you're, you're, it seems that you're assuming that there is a type, completely typed module or, or some unit that I'm talking to, whereas, in, in fact, you could type check one function in a class and it's other and it's calling other untyped functions in, in the class and this boundary is you're crossing it back and forth at a very fine grain and it isn't meaningfully you know unless you have a, a some module that you've decided to fully type it's not really that you're it's crossing more, a boundary between that's why we rejected Jeremy's approach off the bat we did not want to deal with this has been things. a big sort of debate over the last but 10 years, I'd say. About this is exactly why our paper immediately says we convert a module, not an individual function, or just say a fractional function. Mm -hmm. He allows a fraction of a function. Half the statement is in, in types, the other half is untyped. Ah, Jeremy does it all! <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing. Uh, I think, because part of this is that people don't want to be faced with monolith monolithic requirements. Oh, now if I'm going to put a type here on this on, to tell me that this is returning this to document that, no, now I have to document, to type check the whole module. Uh, I, I don't think that's, that's where the motivation for this comes from, right? You, you want to have that flexibility is important. We found in particular in Sraga, documenting the API and not type checking the internals is important. Yeah, uh, there's, a, there's an intermediate point that I think is very interesting. Uh, we actually adopted Jeremy's system in Yetalog. Uh, and we realized that, uh, you know, in Jeremy's system, uh, you've got explicit type annotations. You have this special type annotation, which we call, and Jeremy calls asterisk. That is the thing that says, uh, we're exempting this from static type checking, so it needs to be dynamically checked. Uh, and then there's this additional question, which is, for the unannotated case, how do you interpret it? And there's two possibilities. One is, that you interpret it as the equivalent of any, in which case uh, you have optional typing. It says that anywhere you have not annotated, you've got just dynamic type checking. Or you can say the unannotated I case, that's correct. or you can say the unannotated case is a anonymous unique type variable that has to be, so has to be solved for, in which case the, uh, the unannotated code is still, you still do static type inferencing and static rejection. So now you can have the full flexibility of Jeremy's system with regard to things you say explicitly, and then have distinct modules that are distinct only with respect to which meaning they implicitly assign to the unannotated case. Okay, and again, if I go back to, to at least my motivations for doing this, uh, if I write dynamically type code, that the given type discipline may or may not cope with very well, either because it's too complicated to express, even though it can be expressed, because you know in Idris you can do it, or because it's just too tiresome, or because I, 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 I don't want to write these things, I do not want it to change the semantics of what I'm doing, which, is, which means that when you don't annotate, not only does it mean dynamic statically, it means you're not checking anything, it's just running the way it does. You haven't tampered with the semantics of anything which is very important. If there is a clear boundary and you say this module is one thing and the other module is another thing, in that context it makes sense to actually check at the boundaries because you can say that thing is in a typed language and it can have its own runtime with its own costs. But if you're actually trying to fluidly develop in an environment where you, you want to get those benefits of documentation primarily rather than error checking, which I think are overrated, you don't want to do that. You want to document something even if it isn't exactly true, even if this function is hard to type, to type check, or, or the type checker barfs at me and tells me it's not correct, I still want to document it, and I want to do that at a fine grain, so I don't want to, to get into this, this sort of problem. So maybe to help you, uh, you know, what is, so what did the gradual typing mean in that original paper? I think what was going on in that paper is that there were like three or four, at least three or four goals, that, and I wanted to achieve all of them, right? So. Uh, soundness was a goal. Uh, high performance for the statically type code was a goal because I'm I'm coming from having been a, a scientific computing C++ hacker person doing linear algebra, so that was a goal. Um, uh, you know the 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 unusual checking and you know static type checking and finding errors was a goal. Right, so those were all goals, and um, and so. 
you know, I was analyzing, you know, different implementation strategies and, and type systems and things, trying to figure out which of those, oh, and then I guess another goal is being able to evolve and being able to move the boundary at any point, you know, easily back and forth. That was probably the most important goal for that first paper. And so, and, you know, I guess what we've, what we've found over the last 10 years is that achieving all four of these goals at the same time is really hard, and we're not actually sure if it's possible yet. Uh, and that's why it's been such a great sort of journey <laughs> and a great research problem. You can drop some of these goals and end up with perfectly good engineering solutions. So things like TypeScript, uh, you know, it, it works, it makes some people's lives better. It's not sound in, in our sort of more strict version of that. So, so I will say I was, my, my own experience is colored by being told about and on extremely rare occasions having the program in Common Lisp. And some of you may actually remember what the Common Lisp exists, and some of you may know that there were optional types in there. The optional types were inherited, I believe, from Interlisp or from MacLisp. I can't remember, late 70s, there were optional types in the Lisp systems. And they left a mess behind. That was just, it was a mess to have, oh, there's a type here, and there's a type there, and this function calls that function with a different type, but it all works out. The compiler actually uses those types. That's scary. To optimize, yeah. And it was optimizing based on unsound partial optional type information set false for free. I mean, you didn't have to ask them. That just happened, you know. Right. So I've lived in that world. I don't want to live in that world. And, and I'm sorry, sooner or later, somebody will use an optional type system in his compiler to optimize, and then we're back to the world of SecFaults. We have sinned. The community has sinned against sec because of SecFaults for decades. We, could, we had an option in the 80s to go with sound type systems. And no, we chose C++. The unsound is the all type system. Is it still here? No. <laughs> humanity that we impose that infrastructure. Now we're stuck with that infrastructure that is so brittle and so broken. Yes, in 20 or 30 years from now, we will have sound C++. But that is a, that is a mistake to, to think that when you have types, people don't use them in the compilers and create a mess for the programmer. So, so Security yes. problems have the tech, I mean, many of the technical yeah. problems, many of the security problems are human problems, no question. But those that are technical problems, were partly caused by that opting into that kind of mess. So common list of optional types, yeah, that is the, they use the term optional types, and that's not the definition I use. And yes, the idea that they went ahead and optimized on the basis that someone swore this is an integer. On his mother's grave. And that's where he landed. Uh, but that that is a problem, and so. The idea is that the types should not touch the runtime, and you can, you can, yes, there is that. The they temptation. will sooner or later. Oh, yeah. Some compiler guy will use them. There, there is that temptation. On the other hand, a lot of people were quite happy to not have to, you know, once you put generics in your type system, they're not so eager to use it in their runtime anymore. <laughs> uh, but that there. I think you, you, it's still viable to hold the line and say, yes, this is a type system, and yes, it, it isn't sound and it isn't intended for that, and there are many other things you can do with types, uh, race condition, whatever, banking on them only if it's sound and only if you have completed the module. So one thing that you could do as an intermediate step between these two positions that you seem to articulate is you don't have to uh, do it module by module, you don't have to completely type check a module. When you finally have type checked that module entirely, that's when it goes it's a debate. into the next stage and, and you dynamically check the boundaries and say that it's a, essentially a different language, this is a static language, and, and I can optimize and do all those things only at that point, uh, but not before. I want to disagree, not because it's a debate, but because we really have come to a disagreement. It's a serious disagreement, and I want to bring a point back that was overlooked. Types exist to design your code. Whether you have a type language or not, you use types. You should use types. You ought to use types to design your code. Now, you just mentioned race condition. Let me report a little experience that I had. I volunteered to teach Rust. Don't ask why. I did it for a whole semester. After, and, and I did it with students who, senior students who had not seen much concurrency. Actually, some of them had never seen concurrent programs, never seen parallel programs. 
I had a program, parallel programs in Rust. And as some of you know, Rust prevents race conditions with its type checking. Mm -hmm. I will admit the first two weeks, because we used the beta release, was a mess that couldn't understand the type error messages. Once we got an O over hop, I was blown away that these kids had ne never had any problems writing parallel programs in an error to stock. There were no race conditions. The type system slapped their fingers. We taught them how to design, the type system enforced it, and lo and behold, I, I hate to admit this, but I have to admit it, they didn't have problems with this stuff. So there is something about designing programs with types. That's why I always add this as a very important goal. But it has to be a programming style that's natural, not the programming style that the type checker enforces. And I think now, after 30 years of untyped programming, we have a lot of idioms that we find very natural, that are very different from ML and Haskell, and that work really well, and we should support those. Uh, That's what gradual typing is about, and maybe your kind of optional typing, but Kamala's optional typing absolutely wasn't about that. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. Um, you know, on the list of things I thought was a goal for a type system, the, the mental framework you get for your design is there, uh, below documentation, but uh, above implementation speed and above, and certainly above correctness. Though maybe, maybe this is a different domain. Maybe for concurrency, maybe the Rust people really, it really works. It sounds like, uh, you know, maybe untyped ru typed Rust programs cannot go wrong in parallel or some, some suitably <laughs> qualified, you know, snappy aphorism that we can come up with. But the, the, the main use we've had for types, is it sort of evolved almost accidentally, starting with the fact that you'd like to know what, whether it's an integer or a floating point thing when you're writing a compiler and, and partly for... No, for there are two origins of types. One is in algo 60, because you want integers and booleans and chars to burn. Is there a Fortran before that? Maybe Fortran had, Fortran had the I J K yeah, conventions. Yeah. Yeah. They had some of that for raw sphere. Yeah. That's a completely different invention of type system that is completely logical to support correct reasoning about programs. Mm -hmm. That on occasion, they, they coincide. Mm -hmm. In 1994, in when I was in Sabagio at CMU, it very very, very, it hit me like, like some, some thing from the sky that they only now started figuring out how to synthesize those two notions. And to this day, we don't really know how to get that speed in parametric polymorphic languages. We have a good idea, it works well, but we don't get that speed that we really want. It wasn't about speed, it was about reasoning. So different origin, completely different origin. So those are two parts. Look right. at the literature. <laughs> I, I don't disagree with that, but in Fortran, it originated, it was driven by speed. And I, and I dare say that no one would pay attention to the logicians arguing about correctness if there wasn't this tradition that these type languages were faster. I, I, I disagree. Jim Morris, in 1968, with his first type system for Lambda Calculus, with the best dissertation, 1968, right, uh, was not about speed. It was about, I can say certain things. I'm not saying that isn't true. I'm just saying that the wider world wouldn't pay attention if it wasn't speed. So maybe they're two different kind of types. We have a couple of questions. Let's, uh, Cormac, do you still want to? Uh, yeah, I think um, set faults are dead. Those days are gone. I think everybody in the room knows this. Any VM? So Bjarne did leave. Yeah. Sorry? Bjarne did leave. So yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no VM designer would ever allow that kind of those days are gone. Yeah. It's, it's fantastic. <laughs> you can say this in this room, but not in the real world. <laughs> no, I'll say it in the real world too. I think those days are gone. C++ exists. <laughs> right. C still exists. Not C exists. The, I mean, the we have the legacy languages, yeah. Okay, there was another question. Oh, there, there's a Shriram still? Or was that your... Uh, did we cut you off before? No, that's okay. all I wanted okay. to say. Sorry. So, uh, Going back to uh, what Eli described as the confusion between two different kinds of gradual typing, I believe there's actually more consequences to that distinction than have been laid out. Uh, one of the things that I run into while thinking about language design is that uh, the, the, let's just call it the Seed Gaha style versus the, you know, uh, Tobenhoff style, the license style. Uh, one of the things I like about the Tobenhoff style, the license style is that I have two different languages. I'm designing each of those languages independently. One of them is just a simple untyped language. The other is a simple typed language. And I have to separately think about the mediation between the two. 
In contrast, when I have the mixed mode of writing my program, I have to design one language that is somehow the union of these two things and of that interface between them all inside the same language. And I personally find that much, much harder to think about. Right? I have none that language where there's no types, I don't have to worry about it at all. Then there's this type language that never has any, and I don't have to worry about the denotations of that language. And yeah, maybe there's a contract interface between the two like these guys did, or maybe there isn't even. I say screw it, doesn't matter. Right? But if I put the any's with the types and with no types, everything into this one language, it's a much more complicated language. So I actually think that that I see a way to bridge these two gradual typing philosophies because really it seems to me you should do both. You should have a optionally typed language where they're mixed, but where you when the thing that saves your sanity is you do not touch the runtime semantics. It is completely a matter of, of, of this analysis. And when you evolve parts of that program, so a whole module in this language where you can mix actually type check soundly, you can then say, hey, you know what, now it fits the definition of my fully typed language. <coughs> I don't and think I can address my point at all, though. My point is that I still have to design that first language that lets me mix them. Yes, you do. And that's a much more complicated language. So the evolution path still means I have to start at the beginning. Uh, so there are assumptions there that it's, you, you say it's a much more complicated language, but it isn't. You start, you design a dynamic language, and you put whatever type system you want, and all it does is do static checking and linting for you. It doesn't change the lang what the language does, its dynamics, at all. So you can have a very nice, simple, classical, dynamic language. That's the only way to actually to do it honestly, because that will prevent you from ever being tempted to, to mess with the semantics through the types. And you, type, and you decide what you want to type check, and you have to design a type system, yeah, God save you. And then you, you have that, and then if you decide that you know, there's a type system or even annotations that, that you want to even interpret possibly differently when you know that they're all true and all solid and, and have been checked, then, then you have this typed language that you wanted to design anyway. Yeah, was, there was a question from Kim for a while, and then... I think Jeremy wanted to react, respond to that. Oh, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Sure. Maybe just a quick thing. I, I think, based on what we're trying to build off of graduate tech systems, I think if if you aren't trying to do the sound thing, if you're doing more like the optional type thing, then dealing with the dynamic type, it's just part of the type checker. That's, that's easy. That's easy. It's yeah. the, the runtime part is hard. Yes. And is, you know, there's, a, there's research to be yes. done. Yes. Um, and if you want to do the sound thing, I claim both of them are hard. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. The, which both things? The, both, both the static and the dynamic system are now much harder. Mm, or at least harder. the static is still easy. Yeah, yeah. The static if you really don't cool. accommodate programming idioms, it might be easy. Ah. But that's the whole point. Yeah, you yeah. want to accommodate yeah, the yeah. idioms that people have so they don't have to rewrite the code. That's a good point. Sam is responsible. So I think that, in fact, the approach that Gilad described, even whether or not you take his position on affecting the dynamic semantics, is what you have to do to build gradually typed systems. That if you, you can't have a system where the, you just design a type language and design an a dynamically typed language independently and then create a new gradually typed language by combining them, the, the interface is not going to work out if you pick uh, a it's small talk and not independently, not independently, those are two very different words. You pick a uh, small talk and Haskell and then uh, no matter what choices you make for soundness or optionality at the boundary, things are going to be very difficult. I think ultimately you have to design these two languages to be very similar uh, in exactly the way that Gila laid out, even if regardless of which approach you take. So, Kim? <coughs> yeah, I wanted to make a couple of comments related to things you guys talked about earlier in the discussion. Uh, first, I thought you both did a nice job of kind of talking about the strengths of statically typed languages. Uh, I was a little surprised that you didn't refer to the recent research in the last uh, five years or so on software engineering and the benefits, proven benefits of, of static typing. In particular, you both mentioned the documentation, but in fact, machine checkable documentation, which is a big win. My sacrilegious comment is that then it kind of indicates 
that people who write in implicitly typed languages like ML or Haskell and don't insert that type information are missing about half the benefits of a statically typed language. I was very careful in using the words explicitly, statically, type check language. Okay. I heard you say that. That's why I wanted to bring up I wish. Type. Look guys, I hated types. I will admit it. And when I hate something, I go study it. <laughs> So eventually I ended up with the Vatican, at least the American Vatican, of types. Of course, the Vatican with the popes, there's two or three of them. And I studied types at their knees, and I practiced what I, what I studied, and then I went back with a much more enlightened opinion of why I hate them. <laughs> <laughs> that does not mean I don't now you found the light. I just, I just, as I said many times now, at least three times, I use them all the time to design code. And there are certain situations where I will imagine myself imposing them on a lot of people that work for or with me. Okay. Yeah, so, so my comment on that is I've, I've always found it that it's a lot easier it's, it's a lot easier to separate the types from the runtime because all that complexity doesn't come in. It's also a lot easier to separate the inference from the type system because if you do something like Hindley Miller which is married into inferences that constrains you it makes your problem harder so so I'm really in favor of having if you are using inference I'd like it the inference to actually then annotate things for me and I'd like that to be a completely separate mechanism uh, and the, the problem is that there are a lot of people who just don't want to write things uh, which is which is still still an issue that you know you can have too much notation it can be a problem Cardelli's paper, 92 paper, Typeful Programming, I think Typeful Programming buried in France. A lot of people don't understand that. ML people, Haskell people do not think of in France, good people who understand this paper on Cardelli, do not think of type in France as an essential part of a programming language. There's a kernel that is, that is explicitly statically typed, and it, ideally it should be exposed to the surface, and inference is a tool in your IDE that helps those people who don't wish to write down types restore those types. Period. Hindley Miller is just an algorithm, but the, but the it's one of two types. algorithms that we've explored extensively in the literature. Absolutely, thank you. If you look at the paper, the the essence of ML, it in fact states that XML, the XML paper absolutely does that, but it came after typeful programming. We call it the XML paper before it was before XML, but it's the essence of ML. So, uh, Kim mentioned that in the past five years there's been literature in the software engineering community on the proven there. Can you tell us a little bit about what those papers are? I've read those too. Well, I'm asking Kim. <laughs> um, yeah, there uh, seems to be a lot of good evidence. I mean, it's hard to, be, it's hard to be software engineering, work, engineering you? stuff. You're not talking about Stefan Hannenberg's work, are you? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. I mean, well, <laughs> you know, nobody's done great work. In this area. But there seems to be good evidence that, for example, having APIs with the type information makes a big difference. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. You know, I think it's a leprechaun of programming languages. Well, it's good that somebody is starting to do that. Yes. Kind of and we should go back. And I, it's very clear that when you discover a bug before you kill a Mars mission, <coughs> that it, and before you launch the mission, it is cheaper. Because a Mars mission is very expensive. So clearly, there's leprechaun of software engineering that discovering bugs early is cheaper is a good thing. There's, there's clearly some case where you can prove that. But what the actual number is, who knows? Nobody has done it. The citations in the literature are actually circular. Circular. I, you heard that, right? The next thing is, the same thing is for, for types. If I have, if, if I were to test a code base of a 30 million lines of code with thousands of programmers and each does type and untype, I would believe in those papers. I would accept the research result. When I go with 25 freshmen or 25 graduate students, I'm sorry, or five graduate students, I just don't know what to make of it. It's not even statistically irrelevant. No medical journal would publish that. <coughs> so, so I'd like to make another point, which is types and languages, co the type system and the language, they, co they tend to co-evolve. There are languages where it is quite possible that things do not work out with types. So as I, as I said something about Haskell, and it was interpreted as being disparaging because most of what I say is disparaging, but <laughs> it's just my natural mode of expression. The thing is, 
when you do something like currying, where all you have is these functions from alpha to beta, without there, the only structure you that you seem to have is types because it's really it's very uniform, very compositional, but you really don't have anything psychologically to, to hang on that. Whereas with objects, with record types, with anything that gives names to things, you have a there's a lot of a type system even in a dynamically typed yes. object oriented language. Yes. And so Pascal, quite possibly, really, you couldn't, you couldn't survive without the types. The problem I have with people who then leap to the conclusion that and no other language could possibly do that. Is it just currying or higher order programming in general? I think it's mainly, well, it's, it's, curring. it's mainly currying. It's it's curring. Yes, yes, yes. Right, exactly. There's no names to these things. Philip? Yeah, so, so one thing that... Uh, no one has mentioned so far with types is, is um, things like type classes, right? Or in Scala, we don't actually have type classes. We, we, we you know, implement them using implicit parameters and so on. And, and there, we actually have a situation where the explicitly writing down uh, option is not very desirable, right? You kind of uh, it's not very helpful. Uh, like you don't. You actually want to leverage the the, the you know type system to to infer facts right statically and then kind of use them. The, the, um, I'm just wondering like where does this fit in because it is a kind of a useful thing right. Type classes can be quite useful uh, at least in the you know statically typed. Uh, Right. So, so uh, when I said that types and languages go evolve, and Scala, of course, you know, the fact that you you need the types to do Scala implicits, whatever, is hardly surprising, right? And and there's I've I've seen people on the verge of, of suicide with implicits, right? So, so whether implicits are a great idea, making things implicit in general is a very delicate game. Very often it seems desirable and turns out to be terrible because. When well, you didn't have to write it, and then you don't have to read it, and no one knows that it's there, and everyone forgets, and you, you get into all kinds of problems. I second that. Uh, <laughs> like, there's one place in Rust where you cannot actually write down what you want to write down, and it's not rich enough if you can. It's called lifetimes, inferred for you. And when you have errors in lifetime, by golly, you want to pull your hair out if you have any left, or you just jump out of the window. I mean, it's really bad. Implicit are bad. Implicit things like that. You can't state the lifetime explicitly? On, on, on many equations, no. There's a reason for that. All right, so we have about five minutes or four minutes to wrap up. Just, just, oh, just seven o'clock. Yeah. Take my time away. Right, but then we I reserved all our words for the end. That's why I'm giving you a warning. Oh. <laughs> uh, four minutes till bedtime. <laughs> So I waive my time. So <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 please. Have it. So there was a question in the back. Ben. Wait, implicit to bad? So I should write equal string and equal bool and equal int and have ten different functions for all that? Yes. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear the question. So he, uh, the question oh, was, should I? Oh. <laughs> Next. <laughs> I think I would like to address it. I'd like to address a point that we have glossed over. Uh, a dynamically typed language is usually type sound. Okay? You don't need types to have soundness. You can prove it, and that's what Bob Popper, for example, following Dana Scott type, calls a unitype system. Semantically, a dynamically typed language is usually a language with a single type. It is easily typeable, and then if you can you can apply the theorems. All proof techniques will show you that this is type sound. You will not have any errors explicit, except for those of the explicitly state. When you add types, the last thing you want to do is give up that property. You want to reduce the list of errors or runtime signals that you get. But you don't want to get new ones. If you add types <laughs> optionally, sooner or later, a compiler writer who doesn't understand that fundamental fact of life will come along and mess up. Okay? That's why optional typing is not acceptable. You start from a sound 
sound artifact, an untyped sound artifact, you don't want to give up that property. Okay? That's why I'm so adamantly opposed to optional types in the common loop sense. There's a, there's a question to that? If you're uh Positing incompetent compiler writers, isn't all help lost anyway? No, 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 no. I, 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 most compiler writers are very competent, but all compiler writers are human, and all compiler writers mess up. And some compiler writers think they're designers. That's the worst kind. <laughs> and if they do, then they act like the common list guys, for example. Was that, or, and, and we see this. We see this happening right now. Under the banner of saying we are gradually typed, we see these type systems that completely leave up soundness. And they shift the burden from the compiler writer to the colleagues who wrote that code. Right? Let's pause it for a moment that compiler writers are extremely competent. Let's, even, let's, com let's pause it even more so that the people who create the runtime system are even more competent. They're perfect. Therefore, we call this a trusted code base. It is perfectly okay if a typed code compiled interacts with an untyped code base, runtime library, that is written by perfect angels that happen to walk on Earth. But when you move to a big system of 500,000 lines of code written by all kinds of human beings, failing human beings, then you have suddenly opened the door to the trusted code base, okay? And you're much more likely that the boundary introduces violations to the types that you've written now. Because now you have to think of every part that is not typed yet as a part of the trusted code base. Okay? And when, it, when there's a single mistake, and there will be mistakes in compilers, right? in your system, it opens up the door for all kinds of problems, and we get sick falls back. That's why I said it before, I say it again, I know Cormac is right in principle, they're gone, but we will get them back if you don't have watch out. Okay? That's what I'm afraid of. And as, as uh, I forgot the Rust designer's name, somebody in the Rust community said, Brent Hoare? Nico? Nico. Nico says so nicely, even race conditions are set faults. They don't externalize themselves as such, mm -hmm. but they're just as bad. Okay? So don't think of the primitive sec faults that certain people in the C and C++ community bestowed on us. Think of the general idea of a sec fault. They will be back. That's why it matters so much that we stay sound. Until we prove that soundness is bad. <laughs> or dead. <laughs> Ready? Uh, so the optional typing in the Lisp says I agree. And Yes, the pressure, the pressure to subvert things is always there, and the only thing is I don't believe there's anything we can do about it. So in Dart, there are people who say, compile to JavaScript, what do we want? But there's a believe the types mode, okay? <laughs> Which is exactly, I think, what Matthias is talking about. Because if you believe the types in Dart and then compile on that basis into JavaScript, your JavaScript will fail in ways so bizarre that, that you will never be able to dig it up. But it's unlikely, and it'll be faster, and, and yes, the, the slippery slope is there. Which doesn't mean that, you know, but that, that'll come up anyway. If you try to, do, to, to check at every boundary, it gets costly, that those people will not accept that either. We, that's why check mode in the Dart is a development thing, because it is too expensive to run in production. And you, know, and you can disagree with that, but most people feel that it's too expensive. And so I don't think that the, the hum undesirable humanity of compiler writers should subvert the idea that it's best to leave the dynamic semantics alone, have a purely dynamic language to start with, and put the types in without touching those semantics, because that will keep things a lot simpler. And simple is good. Simple does avoid a lot of problems and a lot of other mistakes. And, yeah, I think that's, that's all I wanted to say on that. All right. Simple is good. Simple is good. <laughs> <laughs>